40 years of the International Capital Market Association. Four decades of extraordinary developments in the financial markets. From the ruins of the Second World War that left nothing of the international financial systems, a decade of restructuring and epic struggles with communism, the arrival of a new liberalism, the onset of globalization, and the monetary unification of Europe, to the 21st century, with the emergence of new political and economic powers and a truly global capital market. Nothing happens in history without courageous, innovative and visionary people. The Geniards, Goetz, Stancliffe, Zombanakis, Hambros, Rothschilds and Warburgs amongst others. These were the fathers of the Euro markets. It all began in 1963 with Autostrada, the first bond issue that took advantage of the Euro dollar investor base, the legendary Belgian dentist. This paved the way for today's trillion dollar capital market. The whole business got a huge boost when they passed the interest equalization tax in the United States, which pretty well cut New York out of the international capital raising business, which moved entirely to Europe. There were several contenders for the location of this offshore market. London ultimately won out. London was a good place for banks because it had, uh, first of all, the language, tradition. Substantial amounts of capital looking for investments, a tax treatment that would be particularly favorable to trading international bonds. The authorities will take you as gentlemen. If you do not behave as a gentleman, they will intervene. If you agreed something with somebody, you knew they would live up to it. Operating outside of any national regulatory authority, the Eurobond markets proved to be a hotbed of innovation. These people could only survive and develop by being innovative and creative. There was a very innovative environment and it was brought about by it being a very competitive environment because there were people who saw this as a rather profitable activity. There was always room for a newcomer uh, with a good idea. So you saw the development of swap business and then in the late 70s, the early 1980s, the zero coupon business. The market was continually developing new ways of doing business that were attractive to clients and to major sources of funding for the market. In August 1981, the World Bank did the first swap deal. It took the World Bank two months to do the first swap transaction with IBM. Every government in the world, believe it or not, had to approve the transaction. And even after it was done, the counterparty risk, IBM, was insured by Aetna Life Insurance Company. Governments of the world insisted that we get an insurer against the corporate obligation. From the very beginning, the secondary market was crucial. Stanley Ross was involved right from the first euro bond at Strauss Turnbull. I'd been working there for 12 years, trading in global arbitrage. It was great to get that first issue. It was good news. The bad news was that I had to trade the bloody thing. For many, many years, you could always get a price in Autostrada, and that was the hallmark of the Eurobond market, whereas when they issued bonds in New York, if they didn't want to make a price, didn't want to make a price. And in Europe, if we were traders, we made a price. In 1978, Ross transformed the market when he made bond prices transparent for the first time. I knew that Reuters was trying to develop a screen system, and I thought, with that screen system, they can see that in Hong Kong. They can see it round the corner. Everyone can see it. And so I went to them and I, I said, look, I want my prices up on the screen. The huge growth of new issuance in the 60s led to its own set of problems, the clearing and settlement of bearer bond transactions uh, was a little bit complex. We hadn't gone electronic at that time. We still issued physical bonds, and they had coupons attached to them. So within these organizations, they had to clip the coupons. And you know, we had to move away from all of that. There were some concerns that uh, the market would have to institutionalize itself to some extent. There was a strong feeling that something of a self-regulatory nature should be put in place to address the weaknesses of the market. A group of market practitioners got together to try to sort out the problems. The um, AIBD AGM of 1969 was, uh, was put together. At that meeting we were absolutely all keyed up and all gung-ho that, that we, that this uh, uh, small 
band of us really had drawn together all these people from uh, fr from across the world. All markets need a, an appropriate structure of uh, formal regulation, but equally uh, it's important that that's not too kind of heavy and not too onerous, and therefore it's very important that markets also develop their own self-regulation arrangements. Deregulation and privatisation gave a huge impetus to the development of the markets. It eventually created what you might call a total merger between national markets and the international market. London then became a genuine centre where capital could flow backwards and forwards. But they were sort of mini big bangs going off in all the other major uh, European markets. The spread of deregulation and privatisation, together with the fall of the USSR, were to usher in a new era of globalisation for the capital markets. I think the awareness of the, the host governments in Europe was, was greatly increased in, in that period. And I think as a result of deregulation and the awareness of, of the capital flows were being, becoming more global. And this is why you saw a number of host governments trying to create more dynamic capital markets in their countries. It really started in this country, but spread um, in other parts of the European Union. The drive for more integrated and liquid markets continued and led to new innovations which had an important role to play in today's financial crisis. I think the main lesson is that you know there's nothing particularly new about this. It's all happened before in one form or another. Uh, the laws of economics uh, follow the laws of physics, you know, what, what goes up will ultimately go down and what goes down will ultimately go back up again. There are always successes and there are always failures. That's again part and parcel of a healthy, lively, vibrant, growing market and one shouldn't be um, concerned about that. I have uh, no real doubts that the market will continue to expand uh, and will be just successful, as successful globally as it has been regionally.